I I am so blessed to be speaking to to like the whole state today. It's great to uh, to be here at South and Baker and Livingston and Mid City and Homa and online and people watching on television. You didn't know you didn't know I knew so much about your church, did I? But uh, thank you, and uh, I just appreciate all of you. And um, I don't know um, how I got here, but the truth is. I am so overwhelmed to be speaking at this church because without a doubt, this is one of the greatest honors of my life that you would allow me to be here. And Pastor Jonathan is an absolute legend. We love him. We are so proud of what the Lord has been doing in his life. And that just reflects on every part of the leadership of this church. And uh, Pastor Tay has been taking us around, and, and we've had the greatest time with him. And, uh, and I've never been treated so good. I mean, they say that Southern hospitality really is a thing. Uh, but Southern hospitality plus uh, this church culture mixed in together is just an encouragement bomb in my soul. That's what it is. And uh, so I just, I'm just so, I feel so loved. And when you go to a place and you speak, you go there and you think, man, I'm just going to love on people. I'm just going to encourage them and they're going to be blessed. But in places like this, you do way more for the people that come to speak to you than you could, they could ever do for you. So I'm, I'm just privileged. And the, this church and the legacy is just, it's beyond, I, I think you're so close to it sometimes. I know you see it. But it's hard. When you're, when you're in the miracle, it's kind of hard to understand the dynamic of what's really going on. But you just need someone from Los Angeles to come in every now and then or a different state just to remind you that revival is not coming to this church because revival is already here. Amen. So um, praise God. Turn your Bible to Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. I have to be very aware of this service to be on time because this is, this is the lunch special service. I know. I understand. Uh, but Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5, and I'm going to speak to you about something that I really believe is going to help encourage people on the journey and pathway of life and the vision that God has given them. And, and once again, I just want to say thank you for the privilege of being here. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. All right, here's a sermon right here, 12 words. The whole thing boils down to these 12 words. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. Six words. I actually drew a line in my house between these 12 words and put like sheets of paper to remind me. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. Draw a line. And he shall direct thy path. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct thy path. I'm going to tell you how those 12 words literally transform my life as I just take you on a journey uh, through my life and pastoring and, uh, and been pastoring in L.A. for 24 years now. So I started at 20. And uh, what I've learned along the way that's kept me going in a very difficult spot, and hopefully this, this insight that I learned will help you. Father, I just thank you that we're all on a journey. We're all going somewhere, and all this message might relate to some people in some ways, and in some ways it won't, but I pray that the truth would guide us and lead us to wherever you need us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. At the age of 20, I came to uh, downtown Los Angeles to pastor a church. Now, I got a word when I was 16 at a youth camp. That's why you need to bring your kids to youth camp because God usually gives a life-changing word. And I was 16 when God uh, spoke a word to me that one day I'd be in LA to pastor a church. And it, it was such an awesome move of God at that youth camp, and, but I didn't realize that it would happen at 20 years of age. Because when I was 20, uh, my dad, Tommy Barnett, received a building in downtown Los Angeles that was almost getting ready to be sold because they were having a hard time getting anyone into the church. The neighborhood had changed, the dynamics have changed, and, and people were not attending the church anymore. So they gave it to my dad and asked him from Phoenix if he can plant a church to kind of resurrect that church. And so I never forget, I was 20, I got the vision from God. I remember hearing that one day I'd be in L.A. from God, but I never told my dad because I didn't want to manipulate it. If it was God, it would happen. And so this is how it happened. My dad took 10 pastors on a tour around L.A. to ask them if they could help him plant the church. And they were all excited. They were like, man, we're going to pastor a church in L.A., Sunset Boulevard. They were thinking Hollywood. And it's true, the church is on Sunset Boulevard. But it, sunset starts in one of the worst neighborhoods in L.A., and then later it gets to Hollywood and the Sunset Strip and all that. And so when these pastors saw the building and they saw gang members like sitting on the steps every day, pretty much taking over that building, every single one of them said, I don't feel led of the Holy Spirit to come and pastor this church. And so I was with my dad on the tour, and I was 11th on the list of 10. My dad couldn't find a real pastor, so he asked me to come and help him plant the church for three months. He said, son, I need you for three months until I found, find a real pastor. 
It's been 24 years, and we're still looking for the real pastor. I mean, I, maybe, maybe that pastor's here today. I don't know. And, uh, but, but that's been the journey. I, and, and I started, and I was a pastor, son of a mega church, one of the first churches to crack 10,000, 7,000 seat auditorium. And now I'm in my little Nissan Sentra, and, and my dad needed a pastor. I'm driving out to LA. And the first week I got there, I started preaching all my dad's greatest hit sermons, you know, and Pastor Larry's greatest hit sermon. And uh, I mean, I'm stealing, I mean, borrowing every sermon I could find of every preacher that I've ever known. And all the great ones that have come through my church. So I had a greatest hit sermons I was preaching. And, uh, but the problem is after 10 sermons I had to come up with week 11 and week 12 and week 13 and one night I looked out of my church I inherited 18 people that were all in their 80s in my church and I was 20 and they actually thought they voted my dad in by accident they got me and so I was already swimming upstream right from the beginning and the first week I got there you know I moved the organ from one side of the stage to the other and I lost half my congregation Livingston campus and the first week that I'm just trying to personalize it to different churches here and uh, the first week I got there and uh, I went from 18 down to 2 and I, and I was so discouraged and uh, and one day I looked out and, I, and, and, and no one was in my building I had a 700 seat building and nobody was in my church and I, I was so discouraged, and, and I went home, and I cried on my pillow for like three hours. I said, God, I'm the biggest failure in the world. The anointing is on my grandfather and my father, but I think it skipped a generation with me, and I just cried on my pillow for hours. In the middle of my tears, the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you to stop your crying. I want you to get up, and I want you to go to Echo Park. Now, for God to tell you to go to Echo Park in the 1990s, in the middle of the height of the gang's warfare, was a pretty bold word. I thought God was mad at me for being a big old crybaby and was just going to finish me off in a drive-by shooting and get somebody there who really could do the job. I mean, they, we've had like MS-13 and all this coming through our neighborhood, of wars going on, gang wars. And, but that night, I took a six-hour prayer walk around L.A., I went to Skid Row and I saw homeless people by the thousands that were lined up. I walked around the streets and I saw, I saw young men that were, that were being arrested up against police cars. And I saw everything that was going on, the war and the battle and, uh, and just all the different things that were going on and helicopters that were looking in the park and searchlights for people and just chaos. And that night God spoke a word to me. He said, from this day on, after this prayer walk, I never want you to think about the word success ever again. I want you to go home. I want you to rip up your five-year plan, your 10-year plan. I don't want you to think about where you need to be, where you want to be, what the ministry ought to do for you because you're a third-generation pastor's kid. I want you to throw all of that away, and I want you to die to the dream of being a success, and I want you to live to the dream of being a blessing. Live to the dream of building the dream of those young men. I want you to live to the dream of serving your community. I want you never to think about the word success. I want you to be healed on the inside, and whatever I put in your hand, I want you to use it to serve your community for the rest of your life and lay it down for the city of Los Angeles. I said, but God, I have nothing. I have no church members, all my staff members. How do you give God something when you feel that you have nothing left to give him? But can I tell you, there's always something. You always got something. Yeah, maybe you've got brokenness. That's just enough that God needs. Give God your brokenness. Give God your, the dark days of your life. Give him the burned bridges. Whatever you have, you always have something to give God. I said, what do I have? God said, you got a desk and you got a phone. That's all you have left in a church building. So move your desk on the sidewalk and start reaching out to people uh, nine to five with your desk on the sidewalk. So I put my desk out there, my phone, and I was a church secretary and everything. And all the mamas in the neighborhood would walk by and I had a jar of candy and three bags of food. I'd pray about who to give it to sitting next to me. And I would just pay for those and the, and the mothers would walk by in the neighborhood and they'd be like, hola, pastor, hola, huero, which means whitey in Spanish. And then, and then they liked me a little bit more because I play soccer with their kids and then they'd be like, hola huerito which means little whitey in spanish and and they would walk by and that's where the ministry started a desk in the phone and people would call my church and uh, i'd answer the phone i would say la dream center may i help you they said do you guys have a women's ministry in your church i said hold on a second and i told myself well we do now and i went back on and i changed my voice and, I, and it made it sound like i was a woman and say yes we do have a women's ministry how many here know when god gives you a dream you got to act like you're there even though you're not there yet you know and 
and my first my first ministry was a basketball hoop i bought a basketball hoop from kmart the kind that you have to put like water and sand in there to keep it uh, from uh falling over and especially me because i dunk the ball so much i have to make sure it's no well, anyways I, the only thing i'm dunking is donuts but uh but we had our first little basketball hoop in the neighborhood, and things began to happen. And then the church, people started coming to the house of God. And I got one little house that a lady donated in the church to us, and right next door to the building. Before she died, she donated it to the church. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you to start a rehab program for people with drug and alcohol addictions. I said, God, I can't do that. I, I've, I've never used in my life. How can I relate to people if I've never used? And God said, I didn't call you to L.A. to be relevant. I've called you to L.A. to be revolutionary. I want you to open up this home. And so I took these two guys in. They said, what's the program? I said, I have no clue. Just read the Bible and come to church. Don't let the perfect plan get in the way of getting started. Amen? Sometimes you just got to get started and let the, let, let the Lord figure it out as you go. And, uh, and, so, and so there we were in the neighborhood. Then we had two homes open up to us. We had 14 homes in the neighborhood that were filled with people whose lives were being transformed by the glory of God. The entire block and the church that went from 18 to 2, trying to be a success, went from 2 to 600 in the next six months, not even thinking about the word being a, a success. And I realized, in all thy ways, acknowledge him he will direct thy path and I start having fun ministry was fun I wasn't having ulcers in my stomach every week because it wasn't my job to, to worry about the path it was my job to be concerned about being faithful with whatever God put in my hand and I was set free and I said Lord I don't even know what the path is now but I'm just gonna love people with whatever you give me and whatever you choose to build out of it I'll just praise you for it and I was driving down the Hollywood freeway one day I looked to my right I see this hospital it said for sale I pull over to the side because we're outgrowing our little building down there on Temple Street. And as I, as I pull down, I see this hospital. They're filming movies there. And, and, um, and Paramount Studios is taking over that facility. And they're renting it. But they're getting ready to buy it to turn it into a movie set. So Halloween, A Nightmare in Elm Street, all of them were filmed in the, the boiler room of Freddy Krueger, all that. But we had to pray every demon in hell out of that building. But... Uh, <laughs> And some we didn't know about. And, uh, and so we, that building was available right by downtown. And, and I walked right up to Brad Pitt. They were filming. Because I'm not intimidated by actors. I'm intimidated by your pastors. But I'm not intimidated by actors, right? I walked right up to Brad Pitt. And I said, Brad Pitt, man, how you doing? Man, I love your movies. You're, you're not so much Legend of the Fall. But I, I love your movies, man. And, uh, and he stopped. And he looked at me. And he's like, He's like, really? Like, who's this guy talking to me out of the blue? The great Brad Pitt. But back then, we were on TBN. Some people in the last service said they used to watch our show. But we used to get 10 years of free airtime from TBN. And then they charged us, and now we're not on anymore. But anyways, it was good while it lasted. But, uh, <laughs> but, but we were on for 10 years, and, and it, was a great, it helped us really get started the ministry. And, uh, and he stopped. He looked at me. He said, wait a second. He said, I think I know who you are. He goes, I scroll through the channels. And he said, are you that Matthew Barnett? Brad Pitt said this, are you that Matthew Barnett from the Dream Center? No, he didn't say that. I'm just messing with you. I'm just not, <laughs> no. It's just my imagination running away. No, he actually took a cigarette and used my head as an ashtray. But I walked into the building and, and uh, they were there and I said, I want to buy the building. How much is it? And they said, no, Paramount Studios is going to buy it. I said, no, I, but I want to buy it. They didn't even allow me to get a tour of the building. You'll say, what did you do? Well, I looked to my left, and I saw an open door. Like a literal. Sometimes you pray for an open door, and God gives it to you. And sometimes he literally gives you an open door. Because the security guard was not looking, and there was an open door. So I figured that was God's open door. So I looked to my left, and I looked to my right, and I snuck in the building and gave myself a tour of the building anyways. How many here know when God gives you a dream? Sometimes you got to go gangster for Jesus, right? And... Uh, and I'm, I'm walking around that building with one eye on Jesus, one eye on the security guard that was trying to arrest me. That's why the Bible says, watch and pray. You got to get a dream and run from the cops. You know, I'm just like, Lord, help me. And I went to the rooftop and I looked over the city. And God said, I want to give you this building. I want this hospital to be open 24 hours a day. I said, well, God, this, that was so foreign to me. The vision was so clear. And I looked over and he said, the pimps are working 24 hours a day. 
the adult film industry, which preys on runaway teenage girls that gets them into the industry that they never want to be in and oftentimes gets them in human trafficking first. They're working 24 hours a day. The liquor stores are open all hours of the day. If they can be open 24 hours, I want you to build a church that will be open 24 hours where any homeless person can be helped. Any runaway street kid can be helped. A place where the judges can send people into the house of God rather than the prison system. And last month, we had 40 kids, 40 people, actually adults, in our program, 40 people that were sentenced into the house of God for one year instead of a 10-year prison sentence. They went from a death sentence in prison to a life sentence in the house of God. And prison reform is breaking out. Judges are telling people, you're not going to jail. You're going to the Dream Center. And they come into our campus for one year, and God begins to build things in their lives, and, and their lives are being restored because the gospel can do anything better than anything out there. Man-made systems will never succeed unless the Holy Spirit and the gospel of Jesus Christ is just saturates people's lives. And the vision was taken on a form. And now there's 700 people that live in that building but um, whose lives are being changed, homeless families, trafficking victims, homeless veterans, all of them that are living there today. But when we went to the Catholic Church, we told them what our dream was, and they said, this is wonderful, but we're going to sell it for $16 million. So we just kept talking. You know, what, what do you do when someone turn, turns down your offer? You just keep talking. So you wear them out. Amen. And, the, and we just kept talking, and we kept sharing more, and they cried. The sisters, these Catholic sisters of the church, cried and said, this is a beautiful vision. Make us an offer. I looked at my dad. He looked at me. We didn't expect the meeting to go that good. Have you ever been in a situation where you gave God a chance to move, and you didn't really think it was going to happen, but at least you put yourself in a position where it could, and God decided to do it, and you're like, okay, that turned out a lot better than we thought. And they accepted our offer for $3.9 million. And now, and now God's 700 residents living their lives are being changed. And uh, we, we, in 23 years, it took us to finish off that 410,000 square foot campus. 23 years, one room at a time. But I learned from the first day when we opened up our very first room to learn to have a big celebration about the little things in life along the way. This has not been an overnight success. It's been 24 years of one room at a time, one place at a, one floor at a time. You see, we oftentimes think that our, our, our vision is, a, is the ending point. It's the completion point out there. We get to the very, very end, and, uh, and we think, man, that, that's, that's where it's at. But usually, we have to understand that if you can't enjoy the trip on the way to the destination, you'll never enjoy it when you get there. Enjoy every small step along the way that God gives you. And I begin to dream from a wonderful place. And I want you to dream from a wonderful place, a place called Rock Bottom. Rock Bottom is a wonderful place to dream when you have nothing left. Because God doesn't destroy dreams in Rock Bottom. He recreates them in Rock Bottom. And in the middle of nothing left in a prayer walk, God said, I'm going to take you on a different road. And there's people here today that you think that you're at the worst place of your life at the most broken season. Can I tell you, why don't you go ahead and decide to dream from rock bottom? Dream, and usually you'll find out, you'll dream dreams that come from the heart of God, not from your own imagination. And through brokenness, God began to reveal a love for people I never knew that I had, a passion for people that I never knew I had a passion for. And I began to see miracles like the Sunset Boulevard where there's a car wash every night where there's 200 Girls that are lined up that have been sold into human trafficking, like a drive through Men are pulling up, and a girl jumps in the car. Another one jumps in the car. And our team starts to pull up in the middle of the night, and we minister, and we go out, and we give roses to these girls that have been selling their bodies on the streets. And we go out, and we give them little bags as they've been, been sold in the middle of the night, these prostitutes. And so we go out, and, uh, and so we give these uh, little bags, and we have a rose in there. We have lip gloss, all these different things for them. And then we ask them if they ever want to change that we'll be there in the street. And so one night we went out and uh, we found this girl that, that was living on the street. And, uh, and she was out there selling her body and uh, she wanted to change. And so one of our guys in our rehab program, uh, who graduated a few years after the program, but is now on staff, a big old guy, big old strong guy, he goes up to these prostitutes, act like he's making a deal with them. And when they're talking, he steals them away from their pimp and then he takes them back to the Dream Center. Well, one night we took this girl off the street and the pimp saw that we got one of his girls. He's literally chasing us down the freeway in the middle of the night to try to get one of his girls back. 
And then when he pulled around the corner, he looked and he saw about 200 ex-convicts in a rehab program standing outside the building going like this. I mean, these guys are saved, but they're just barely saved. I mean, just barely. If we backslide, we gossip. If they backslide, they kill you because to them, sin is all the same in the eyes of the Lord, you know. And this guy saw a rougher crowd in the church than he ever saw on the street. I mean, our church, we got ex-pimps, we got ex-murderers, we got ex-drug dealers, and that's just the pastoral staff. That's not including everybody else we got going on. I mean, you know you got an outreach church. <laughs> when your ushers wear ankle bracelet monitors, then you know you got an outreach church. I mean, you know <laughs> you got an outreach church when the, when the preacher says, can I get a witness? And everyone ducks because they're afraid that like, somebody might find them. And we begin to see these girls come into the house of God and one by one being transformed. Girls that were branded with an iron as if, as if they were cattle by traffickers and sold across the border over and over again. Because you can sell women over and over and drugs just one time. And they're just, and, and these girls, we get calls and they're saying, we're going to do a raid tonight. And uh, there's this underground brothel or things that are taking place. These girls are being sold. Can you have five beds ready? And they'll call us, the, 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 the Border Patrol or ICE or the FBI or any agency of the government will call us and say, can you have four or five beds available to take them in and, and and help these girls' lives to be transformed in the human trafficking shelter. And none of these girls were in my 10-year plan. None of these girls were in my five-year goal of what I thought the ministry should be. They were in the broken plan of having nothing left but a prayer walk that said, God, I just want to dream your dreams. I want to enjoy the journey. And God's saying, whatever I put in your hand, I just want you to use it and love it and celebrate it and watch me do a miracle. One day I was driving down the Hollywood freeway as I, I used to go the same way to work, and there's a man living under a bridge every day. 16 years, same bridge, same place, never left. His favorite scripture was, I shall not be moved, because he would never move, just live there. He was famous for being homeless. He was so comfortable living there that he was almost like a landmark of a guy that would not ever leave that place. And so he lived there for so long, I tried to get him out of there. I tried to talk to him, offer him money, uh, bring him to the Dream Center, whatever, but he never responded. And one day, um, a girl who was on a Dream Center missions trip from Oklahoma, just a girl from a Bible Belt church in Oklahoma, she just came up to me and she said, Pastor, I heard there's a homeless man that you haven't been able to reach for 16 years. I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to get that man and bring him to the Dream Center. And they deep in my heart, I'm like, yeah, right. I mean, God's man of power and faith, me, has not been able to reach him. What makes you think, what good thing cometh out of Oklahoma? You know, and, uh, but that's what I was thinking, but I didn't say that. And on the outside, I said, well, praise the Lord. Because my dad always taught me in ministry and uh, that when somebody tells you something you don't think they can do, you never discourage your dream. You just look at them and say, well, praise the Lord. And she said, I'm going to go reach that guy you haven't reached in 16 years. Praise the Lord. And so she goes under the bridge, and she says, Sir, you're coming to the Dream Center to get a meal. We do 1,500 hot meals a day. But we're going to get you a meal. Come to the Dream Center. He said, No, I'm not going. She said, Yes, you are. He said, No, I'm not. She said, Yes, you are. He said, No, I'm not. And she grabbed him by the hand, like the Grinch, you know, like a little girl in the Grinch, and grabbed him by the hand and pulled him to the Dream Center food line. I saw him there. I said, How did you do this? I have not been able to reach this guy for years. How did you do it? And, and Baker Church, it was amazing. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to incorporate everybody in here, right? And uh, I said, how, how did you do it? And, and she said, well, pastor, my, my, my youth pastor, my youth pastor told me that I ought to compel people to come into the house of the Lord. And she said that word compel in the Greek means to physically force them into the house of the Lord. I'm like, I don't know if that's perfect doctrine, but it worked. It's good enough for me. And that man came every day, got his free food, went under the bridge. Got his free food, went under the bridge. He didn't want to stay for Bible study. He didn't want anyone to teach him. He didn't want to be a part of the Dream Center. He just walked in and, and never broke stride, got his free food, took it under the bridge. I'm getting mad, and I'm saying things that really aren't spiritual, but I'm making things up like, oh, God, you know, this man is getting free food. He's just using us. He doesn't want to change. And I was getting bothered by it. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, let this man use you and take all the free food that he wants. Let him use you, because if you want to be a bridge of hope to the world, you've got to allow yourself to be walked on if you want to be a bridge. Let him use you. 
And God reminded me when I was called during the Ron Canoli age, remember? If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Well, now he's taking me up on the offer, amen? And, uh, and every day he's just, he's just getting free food, free food, free food, free food. But one day he came to the line and he said, I want to go into your rehab program. I couldn't believe it. And I, and I thought, well, brother, praise the Lord. Because this guy was an older gentleman. And our rehab program's tough, man. It's not like the ones in Beverly Hills where they give you pedicures and massages and all that. That's not our rehab program. Our rehab program is beans and rice and Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what it is, right? And he said, I want to go into your rehab program. I'm like, well, praise the Lord. And this guy checked into our program. I thought, well, he's going to last two weeks. Well, he's going to last a month, three months six months this guy went the whole year he graduated our program went to bible school graduated bible school and now homeless barry 16 years under the bridge is now a pastor licensed minister and he's on my staff preaching 18 times every single week for the glory of god I just believe that God can do anything. I believe he can change anyone. I believe that no one's too far gone. I believe that a just man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. I'm just crazy enough to believe that God can tear down any wall, break any chain. We have people pulling up, cops dropping people off instead of prison. This is a dream center where you take them. And then people are like in full on shackles and they'll bring them to the dream center and they'll say, can, can you come into your rehab program? They're taking off the chains. I'm like, we really are breaking chains. Amen. Literally. <laughs> but that Barry, he wasn't in my 10 year plan. In my 10 year plan, that man couldn't take me where I thought I needed to go in ministry. What could that man do for me? And God changed my heart. He said, no, what can you do for that man? And I begin to realize that my job as a young man who was really born in ministry privilege, a lot of it, there's no mistake about it. I have a very unfair advantage over many people in the ministry. And so therefore, one day, I kind of felt bad. I said, God, I have an unfair advantage over everyone else in ministry. And God said, okay, you do. But use that advantage to give a voice to people that have no voice. If you have these things in your life, a legacy of ministry, if God gives you that privilege, it comes with responsibility. So use the privilege that you have to give a voice to people that have no voice, to advocate for the prisoner and the homeless and the broken. Don't feel bad about what you have. Use it and make a difference and, and help people with a generational blessing of your father. Use it to make a difference and use it to serve, not to elevate yourself. Use it to help people and lift them. That's why I've given it to you. And so my dad began to help me raise money, and different pastors began to help me, and, and the miracle began to unfold. And I realized that my dream was not to be a great pastor in L.A., but to be a city janitor, to walk through the streets of L.A., to put back together broken pieces to tell people they can dream again. I close with this. Someone said, yes, Lord. No, I, I know what you meant. Amen. Uh, I close. <laughs> Pick it on someone who's my biggest cheerleader. Amen. I go, and now I close. Yes, Lord, but I, I got you. <laughs> That's why people don't say amen, right? Because the preacher picking on them all the time. But, uh, but I'll, I'll never forget the month of November is one of my favorite months because in November, I just try to do whatever I can to just, I pick up my kids from school. I take them home. I try to be super dad that month and just be at home and just, you know, just do whatever I can to just relax that month. And so, but I have a problem with that because on Thanksgiving Day, my wife does not like me to be near the house until 2 o'clock in the afternoon. She's like, don't even show up till 2 o'clock in the afternoon because you get in the way, you eat the food before it's ready. So she said, you need to just be gone, play football, do whatever you need to do, but just be gone till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So I'm always trying to look for something to do. And, uh, and a couple years ago, I was walking in the morning, and I was walking by this theater, which is across the street from my apartment. And I, was, and I saw this theater, and, and, and there's a movie that was coming out called Frozen. Remember Frozen? You know, the princesses and, and all that. And uh, I said, well, you know, my kids are young, and, you know, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. We'll go see a movie, and then we'll just walk across the street and go home. And so I saw it, and I was walking up to buy tickets around, around 10 o'clock, a few minutes before. And I walked up to the front, and I said, sir, I'd like to buy four tickets to go see Frozen on Thanksgiving Day. He said, okay, but give me a few minutes. I'm opening up the register. So I just was walking around and looking at posters. And as I was looking at posters, God spoke to me. He said, I want you to bring your other children to go see this movie. 
I'm like, other children? Lord, who are you talking about? I promise you, God, I only have two children. He said, I want you to bring all the children who live at the Dream Center, at the homeless family floor, I want you to bring them to go see this movie. I said, well, God, I mean, why? I mean, I mean, why? I mean, have you ever argued with God that you are a better steward of his resources than he is? I'm like, God, that's not even responsible. You know, taking 170 people, my own money, and, I, I'm like, and, and it's like $15 a ticket. And, uh, and God's like, that doesn't bother me. I own everything. Yeah, I mean, just take them all. And I walked up and I said, sir, I'd like to change my order. Instead of four tickets, I'd like to buy 170. He's like, what? He's like, you just went from four to 170 in five minutes. I'm like, yeah, I talked to somebody. And sometimes these things happen. He's like, would you like it regular or 3D? I'm like, regular, right, God? Regular tickets? 3D is $3 more per ticket. We're good, right, God? Obedience discount? Is that fine, God? And, uh... And the Lord being to speak to me, would you take your children to go see it in 3D? And I'm like, well, yeah, God, but 3D is not as good as it used to be. I'm trying to tell you, you remember the days in 3D when you used to have the paper glasses, the blue and the red one? And things actually used to fly at you? Now they just put a glaze over the screen and they call it 3D, you know. And uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to charge more in the offering. Just put a glaze over the screens at church, you know. And, and I, he said, yeah, but I would take my kids to go see it. So I said, okay, I'll buy them all 3D. I said, I'd like to buy 170 tickets to go see Frozen Thanksgiving Day, 3D. And the guy said, okay. And he got me all the tickets. And I show up at the, uh, at the mall or the little shopping center. Um, it's called the Americana in Glendale. And uh, I get there and I have the tickets in my hand. And I show up. It's a beautiful place. And when I get there, the kids who live at the family floor, these are families whose mothers um, were homeless or fathers. And they need a place to go, and they show up in their cars usually, and we give them a place to stay for a year, the homeless families. And so they met me there. The kids ran up to me, man, and they just, like, hugged me, and I had my tickets on my right hand, and the girl on the bottom left. That's what happens when you're overwhelmed by the Spirit of the Lord, and you just, you're just taunting the enemy. It's like, take that devil. That's, I guess that's what it is. And I had the tickets in my hand. I walk into the theater. I'm walking quickly. I'm walking fast because I know what the next question is going to be. And you know what the next question is going to be. That's right. Is there going to be popcorn? And so I'm moving fast because I don't want that question to be asked. And I'm getting to the theater and the kid, hey, pastor, is there going to be popcorn? I'm like, God, is there going to be popcorn? He's like, would you take, yes, God, I would, I would. And so I said to the kid, I go, yeah, you can, you can have whatever you want. He's like, what? I said, you can have whatever you want. Because I told God that they can have whatever they want. But I figured if I muffled it and didn't say it clearly, I'd still get by with being obedient to God and still might save some money. And so uh, you can have whatever you want. And the kid, how many here know if you have children, you can scream something you want them to do and they can't hear you. Oh, I didn't hear that. No. Break the leaves. Oh, I didn't get that. Yeah. But you can whisper something they want and suddenly these little kids have perfect hearing every single time. The little sinners. I mean, wonderful child of God. And the pastor said, we can have whatever we want. And then, they, I mean, they were lined up in five seconds. The register was so 170 deep. I mean, they were buying like crawfish and gumbo. And I mean, we don't have that in LA, but they found a way to get it. It was there. And this little girl comes into the theater, sits right next to me. She goes, hi, pastor. My name is Ava, and I live at the Dream Center. I said, I know. And she said, and she said, she, biggest popcorn, bigger than her, sit next to me. 3D glasses on, milk duds. Just sitting there, just might as well buy it all. Just sitting there. She said, I've never been to a movie theater before. I go, no. She goes, no. She goes, what are these glasses? I go, well, uh, they're supposed to make it clear. Yeah, right, God. And uh, blurry, clear, blurry, clear, blurry, clear, blurry, clear. And so if you keep them on, you can see clearly. And it's, it's, it's blurry if you take them off. She goes, oh, she's playing with them, messing with them. Oh, okay. For like 10 minutes, mess up, blurry, clear. And I'm getting mad because I paid three extra dollars for those things. And I look at her, I'm like, Please keep them on. She said, blurry, clear. I said, please, would you keep them on? Blurry, clear. And then the Holy Spirit began to speak to me through a song in the movie as I was disturbed by this. And the song was, let it go, let it go. And so I let it go. Got over it. And then as the movie went on, she just was talking a little bit. She said, I tell people in my school, I go to Rosemont Elementary, and I tell people that I live in the biggest house in L.A. when I walk home from school. And they say, well, yeah, where's your house? And she points to the hospital. And she goes, I live at the Dream Center. And we just had such a sweet conversation. And then she got into the movie. And then towards the end, she just put her head on my shoulder. 
and just sat there and ate my Nestle Crunch. I was just... <laughs> Laura was dealing with me a lot of things during this movie. And um, but she started singing and having a great time. And the movie was over. Her mom came up to me just frantic just shake it. She said, Pastor, the greatest miracle I've ever seen just happened during this movie. I said, did God put the money back into my account? She said, no. She said, my daughter, I came to your ministry through the human trafficking floor, and then now I graduate over to the family floor. But she said, I came through the trafficking wing, and my daughter was born through the rape of my trafficker. He raped me. And basically out of high school, he owned me, he took my life and took me across the country. And she was born from the rape of my trafficker. And so going across state lines and all across America and roadside hotels and places, she has seen me go into the room and my pimp would put me into this room with these men and she would be locked up in the bathroom many times and see men do some of the most evil things to me and hear the sounds of, of, of practically torture and just, and just, her mother being used and abused all of her life. She said whenever she saw a man, she would look away. She would never look a man in the eye, never. She said that when you spoiled, not just her, but when you bought all those tickets for those kids and did all this for them, she said it reached the heart of my daughter because she'd never seen a man do one nice thing for her in her life. And something happened, something broke from that day, and she became my best friend. Everywhere I go, she just grabs my leg, and she just won't let me go. And I go on a tour, and I'm showing some around, and little Ava just grabs my leg. Sure, the idea costs $4,694.26, but sometimes God is willing to do all that just to reach the one. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. For some of you, that can mean paying a kid's little league fee. That might just be the one thing that he needed in his life to help him turn the corner. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. Maybe to provide a way for a couple of kids to go to camp who can't afford it. And that will be the turning point where they will get a call of God to do something great with their life. Whatever you have in your hand, don't wait till you have something great to give God. Give God every little step of obedience along the way. Every head bowed and every eye closed. All over this room today. There's people that will say, Pastor, I'm just away from God. I'm not living for God. But today, I'm going to acknowledge God in all my ways. And I'm going to acknowledge Him through my sin. I'm going to acknowledge Him through my past. I'm going to give God those places that nobody is fighting for. Nobody wants our weakness. The world wants our strength. We write books in order to try to get other people to give us what we think that they, that they need to give us. Our whole life is based upon how to maximize what someone else could do for us. But the truth is, Jesus wants a side of you that nobody else wants. He wants the dark moments. He wants the, weak, the weakness. He wants the moments where you've tried and failed. And it seems like you have nothing left but a rock bottom experience where you're crying out to God from rock bottom. Whether you be in in Mid-City or Baker or Livingston, but you've, you've heard this, and, and something has just reached through you through the screen, and God's been ministering to you, and He's been touching your heart today. Just start acknowledging Him in all your ways, and He will direct your path. I have nothing to give God. You have brokenness. You have your past. You have burned bridges. You have everything to give God. You see, that doesn't seem fair. Why would a great God want all that? Because He's a God that loves to take people that are in the ashes and take them to the mountaintop and recreate them from rock bottom. When I say three, I want everyone to raise your hands. We'll say today, I want to get my life right with God. I want to know Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I want to surrender. It's time to come back to God. It's time to give him everything. And now, from this day, I declare that I give God whatever I have left for his purposes. One, all over this room. Two, the Holy Spirit is moving. If that's you in this room, I believe there are so many that are getting ready to raise their hand across all the campuses in here today. If that's you, I, I want you to raise your hands across this room right now. Three, lift them up. They're going up. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, my goodness, yes. Just acknowledge him with your past. Acknowledge him with your sin. Acknowledge him with whatever you have left. So many hands are going up, I can't even count them. Just everywhere. Yes, yes. Maybe 60, 70 hands being raised all over this room. Just keep raising them. God is doing something. He's getting ready to recreate you. And this, this is a recreative moment when you're raising your hands. Hands are going up. Everyone that raised your hands, you that didn't, but you need this prayer across all campuses, everyone together, I want you to repeat these words after me. Are you ready? 
everyone with one loud voice repeat these words after me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross that I might be saved. I repent of my sin, and I give you my past, and I give you my future. Recreate me as I repent of this sin, and I give you whatever I have, because it's a lot that's in your hands. Thank you for dying for me. Now I live for you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.